Welcome back, Richard. It's good to see you again. Good morning. Hi, is it uh, early, early August? It is. It's the first week of August, and school is getting ready to start. And so, you know, one of the big things that we talk about at the start of every school year is ADHD. Um, we did a podcast on ADHD last week, uh, talking about uh, medication and the risk for uh, substance abuse and, right. um, you know, goodness, uh, prescribing and, and talking about ADHD in adults. But um, we, we've gotten, we, we received some interesting information or questions from some right. from viewers since then. Right. Yeah. After posting that podcast, had a number of viewers contact us um, asking about ADHD in the elderly. Um, and it, I suspect that many of these questions, much of the concern is coming from the sandwich generation. Um, I guess they would be Gen Xers who are raising their own, they're about at midlife, um, raising their own children while taking care of elderly parents, uh, of their aging parents. And so there is this, you know, everybody talks about the uh, baby boom generation. Well, that baby boom generation is now entering um, old, older ages, and many of them will be cared for by their uh, children. And I think some of these questions, by the sound of them, came from that sandwich generation. Yeah. Um, but I'm pulling our thoughts together. Oh, I thought, well, this would be an easy topic. We'll just go in and look at it, um, only to find out that we really know very little about ADHD in the elderly. Right. And it's, it's interesting that that's the case because we've talked about ADHD and may have died. People have been diagnosed with ADHD for right. decades, you know, since at least the the fifties and even before then it was just called something a little bit different, but right. um, so it, it is interesting. You know, one of the things you always say um, when we talk about ADHD is just when you think, you know, everything about it, uh, something new comes out and here we are with something, something new. So Right. Um, you know, as you said, the questions certainly seem to be coming from more of the sandwich generation where they're caring for their, not only their kids, but their parents as well. Mm -hmm. And when we think about and we talk about uh, ADHD or the possibility, I guess, of ADHD in the elderly, right? We're, we're really looking at, you know, memory issues. We're looking at attention. We're looking at, you know, is it ADHD or is it normal cognitive decline um when we think about dementia or mild or what they call cognitive impairment um so th there's lots of things to think about with with the elderly and the normal parts of aging or the normal um normal things that come along with aging and and how it might relate to something like adhd that's right because when when people in this sandwich these these um middle-aged people ask us about elderly parents, um, what they're seeing is they're just seeing declines in attention, but of course the main problem is uh, problems with memory, right. you know, forgetfulness. Right. Um, and so the first question that, well, is it ADHD? Is it, is it ADHD or is it normal age-related cognitive declines? I mean, we, we all experience those. Um, is it HDA? ADHD and mild cognitive impairment, because in DSM-5, they added this category of mild cognitive impairment, which is sort of one of those borderline diagnoses. It's somewhere between what we would consider normal aging and dementing disorders. Um, and so, but it's a new diagnosis. And then the last, of course, is it ADHD or dementia, because dementia uh, is a much more significant um, diagnosis, okay? But in the elderly, um, the issue of ADHD, they say it is estimated when you when you read this literature, they say it's estimated that about three percent of older adults. Isn't that about the rate in children? Well, three, four, five percent. I, I think it's always difficult to to tell when it when they post and publish these types of statistics because mm -hmm. are they talking about three percent of older adults have symptoms of ADHD or three percent of people who had ADHD when they were younger? Still show signs of ADHD when they continue to be affected by ADHD. It's it's difficult well, to tell. I think that's exactly the that's exactly the point that I think most of these researchers are saying is that the it is estimated that three percent of adults continue to be affected by ADHD, which means 
And, and I think this is a key issue because continue to be affected is the critical element. If, as, you, as, um, as the elderly or partners or spouses or caregivers begin to ask this question, is it ADHD? The ADHD had to be present before old age. Right. So it's a, they continue to be affected. In other words, what they're saying here is that you, if you can't have ADHD as an adult if you didn't have ADHD as a youngster. Right. Well, and, and it's something that we've always talked about because when people talk about ADHD in adults, the, the issue right. is, is that ADHD can only be diagnosed if the symptoms were present before the age of 12. Right. Um, it used to be the age of 10. Now it's mm -hmm. the age of 12. Um, or actually, it was actually eight. younger. I think it was eight. eight. Yeah. Um, and so so there, there is no no such thing as adult onset ADHD. You, you, you right. have to have had the symptoms all your life. And, and that's what one of the things that makes it really difficult in diagnosing adults with ADHD to begin with, because mm -hmm. how do we know what they were like before the age of 12? Right. Uh, and many adults Either they can't remember uh, back to the age of 12. And let's be honest, many people with ADHD symptoms, yes, they had symptoms before the age of 12, but it didn't significantly affect their academics or their be, you know, they didn't get into a lot of behavioral issues. Right. Um, and so it, it's really difficult to tell. So uh, it, it's, it's hard to know what the true prevalence is of, of ADHD in adults and ADHD of um, aging adults, because we don't, we can't reliably tell what was like what it was like for them as children. Yeah, unless unless it unless the caregiver knows, you know, in some cases you have a sibling mm -hmm. who will know that, oh yeah, my brother had school problems. You know, he was never diagnosed, but he had reading problems or he had behavior problems or um he was a he, he was a wild kid, you know, somebody who knew the person as a youngster. Um so you have two problems here. One is you need to have symptoms prior to adulthood, the symptoms had to appear by, by age 12. Second problem is the symptoms look very much like many other conditions that are the no, are normal part of the aging process. So right. it's a, it, it really is a, a difficult diagnosis to make for two reasons. Number one, you need to know early history. And number two, um, how do you differentiate the two? Right. So let's be, so we begin, and th this goes back to that original comment about, we really don't know that much about this. Um, we're just learning about uh, cognitive declines in the elderly uh, because of the baby boom generation. They're going to um, impose that on us. Right. And let, let's not forget that it wasn't too terribly long ago that researchers even you know, felt as though that ADHD kind of disappeared in adolescence. Right. Yeah, that um, it somehow went away. Right. And it's not so much that it went away. And what happens is the symptoms kind of shift and, and look a little bit different. Whereas younger children have a difficult time controlling some of those impulses and overt behaviors that you see as problematic in the classroom. Mm -hmm. As students get older, you know, they're choosing their own classes, they are putting themselves in situations where, you know, you don't necessarily see those kinds of behaviors, but impulsivity and they, they experience an inner restlessness and impulsivity sort of manifests in a different way. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly the same is true for adulthood. Right. So, um, so yeah, when we're thinking about this, it's, it's, it presents a, a significant challenge. So, right. but so when we think about older adults with, with ADHD, you know, as would be the case for anyone with ADHD, that you right, struggle right. with attention and, and remembering things and uh, planning those executive functions that we often talk mm -hmm. about with ADHD. Um, as you mentioned, you know those are symptoms associated with a lot of other things, um, but mm -hmm. but those are sort of the hallmark features of ADHD in adulthood. That's right. The the symptoms are the same as they would be with with a youngster: um, attention, memory, planning, and organization. Um, they, the, the elderly person might find that they have difficulty finishing projects or remembering information consistently. Uh, they can become distracted in conversations, uh, difficulties maintaining relationships. These are all the things we see in youngsters. You know, they, I, I often tell parents, well, if your child is still getting, getting invited to birthday parties and to do sleepovers, it's probably not ADHD because kids with ADHD become too much to handle right. and they stop getting invitations because they're a little too wild in those the places. So 
so we have the same three primary symptoms, forgetfulness, maintaining focus and concentration, and this whole area of self-regulation, you know, managing their time, managing tasks. Um, you know, people talk about, well, I went, I went, I went out to clean the garage and I ended up uh, doing something else, you know, the task completion, task management. Now there is a person, um, Kathleen Nadow, um, she's the founder and clinic director of the Chesapeake Center for ADHD Learning and Behavior. Mm -hmm. And she has published widely on this topic. She's sort of considered one of the experts mm -hmm. in this area of ADHD in the elderly. And she talks about the challenges that manifest after age 60, especially in people with ADHD. Right. And they are not getting things done out of control emotions and it doesn't mean they're they it's anger it's just that they have more difficulty managing their emotions time management yeah. the remnants of hyperactivity you mentioned a couple minutes ago about being distracted and being it, they're not really hyperactive as children are hyperactive but you can see that there's still some remnants of hyperactivity and then all the social challenges that come with it right okay. yeah now the other thing that happens in, and, and, and we had difficulty with this topic. The other thing that happens is that as you age, the frontal lobe of the brain begins to shrink. Mm -hmm. You know, you've all heard that the brain matures by the time you're in your mid twenties, right? What matures is the frontal lobe. Um, in the elderly, the frontal lobe begins to shrink, begins to, to decrease. The problem is that with ADHD, we know that the frontal lobe is implicated in ADHD. So right. once again, you have this conflict between, well, we know that individuals with ADHD are have frontal lobe dysfunction, frontal lobe um, uh, inactivity, uh, reduced activity in the frontal lobes. And the frontal lobes are the seat of the executive functions. Right. Well, as it turns out, the normal aging process also reduces frontal lobe functions right so it's a key issue but but the the frontal lobe is implicated in both adhd and normal aging right so with with that uh, and, and you've mentioned the executive functions um you know when they're whenever the frontal lobe is implicated whether it's because of the normal aging process and you see some of that that shrinking um or it's with ADHD uh, and you see some of that decreased activity in the frontal lobe, we're, we're talking about um, relative impairments in something called executive functions. And executive right. functions, you know, people talk about it as though it's something uh, specific. And it's really a, a broad category of, mm -hmm. of, of things that that we think about related to everything. Um, right. and, and, I, and I think that this is one of the more difficult things for many people to, to really wrap their heads around. And that's because executive functions include just about everything you need to learn right. or to, to, to function um, uh, sufficiently, we'll say it that way. Um, Especially in a school setting. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so you're talking about working memory. You're talking about planning and organizing. You're talking about self control. You're talking about in inhibition of impulses. You're talking about, um, you know, sort of uh, focus, being able to focus on one thing, and then especially when you need to shift your focus to something right. else, and being mm -hmm. able to keep track of all of that stuff. So, all of these, um, you know, memory is rooted there. Concentration and focus is rooted there. Um, planning and organizing anticipation is is based there so we're talking about a lot of different things some of which i, I again are, are sort of decline naturally as we get right. older um, that's right and then there are some that are significantly implicated when it comes to adhd right yeah so the the key with adhd and the elderly is that you don't make the diagnosis in adulthood you, you right. had to have some symptoms prior to um the, the problem is, as we keep saying, the symptoms of ADHD in the elderly are not terribly different from any other symptoms. Now, given that, we thought, well, let's take a look at the at normal aging. Right. You know, what happens in the normal aging process? Well, as it turns out, and th this is some bad news for all of us, 
the brain begins to, <laughs> I don't want to say deconstruct, yeah. but the brain begins to decline uh, by in our 30s and 40s. So we have this rapid increase in brain function into your 20s. But by the time you're in your 30s and 40s, the brain begins to shrink. And right. there are four changes. One is you have reduced brain mass. They're, they're just less of it, but fewer neurons. And as it turns out, that reduction in mass occurs mainly in the frontal lobes, of course, just where you don't want it to occur, and in the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. The reason the hippocampus is important is that's what makes new memories. Right. So when people say, well, I can't remember things the way I used to, the reason is because one of the areas of your brain that starts to shrink in your 40s is the structures in the brain that make memories. Right. So, uh -huh. Yeah. And, and, there, and there's a lot of, well, maybe we should have another podcast on some theories as to why this happens right. uh, and why it happens in the 30s and 40s because, or starts to happen in the 30s and 40s. Because when you think about most people, um, you know, we go through, we, we learn a lot and we go through education through up to 20 or so. And then many of us go to college or we start new careers or jobs. <laughs> And we're do, building that in the 20s. And by the 30s, we're pretty, we become relatively sedentary. You know, and, we are set in what we're doing. And so we're not really stimulating our brain as much as we used to. Right. Uh, we specialize. Learning. Right. Yeah, we we're, specialize, you know. And so our brain doesn't need as many extra neurons because, well, these are the things that we focus on. These are the things that we do every day. We become really good at that. Right. Um, and and we, we become really good at it because we, we get rid of the neurons that would make us want to do other things. Or no, we're not using. <laughs> right. If you don't, you know. Um, so everybody talks about. Well, I hate the. Uh, what do they call the first two years of college? The um, common uh, gen ed. Gen ed, right? Okay. You know, I hate gen ed. I hate to go to high. We have to take all these core. We have to take everything. We have to take English and history and math. And I hate all that. That's exactly what the brain wants. It right. wants stimulation of all those areas. As soon as you begin to specialize. And you begin to focus on law or medicine or history or whatever. Uh, when you begin to specialize, if you're not using those neurons, they're going to die off. Right. It's, it's a use it or lose it. And so you're right. Part of the process is not pathological. It's just mm -hmm. what the brain does. Right. So you have reduced brain mass. You have cortical, the cortex, this thin layer on top of the brain begins to thin out a little bit. And so you have a normal, slower cognitive processing. Right. That's what those neurons do. You have reduced white matter. Those are the connections that connect all the areas of the brain, those sort of wires that we use. That leads to slower processing. And you also have changes in your neurotransmitters. And this is especially, you know, think of testosterone or estrogen, which we know increases dramatically during the teenage years and decreases after that. Okay, and so, so you have this normal variation in neurotransmitter, um, the amount of relative neurotransmitters. Mm -hmm. In women, this is especially important because as estrogen levels decline um, mm -hmm. as we approach menopause, this affects dopamine levels that go to the frontal lobe. So again, you have this the same mechanism of action, but it's a normal part of the aging process, mm -hmm. and it, you simply can't avoid it. So there are these normal changes that occur in the brain. Right. But the important thing about these changes is they're still the, they're, they really still are the stuff of comedians. We all have these little memory lapses, right. but they don't impair us. I mean, right. I might forget my, I might forget where I put my car keys, but once I find them, I can go to work and be functioning. Okay. Right. I know the, I know how to get to work. I know the names of my colleagues and I know my job. So yeah, I forgot, but, but forgetting your keys is not a significant impairment. Right. Okay. So the normal aging process doesn't impair us, but there are things that do impair us. Right. And I mean, that's the important differentiation here. Right. And so, so here we talk a little bit about mild cognitive impairment and, and, right. and dementia. Um, right. And, you know, with mild cognitive impairment, as you said, it's sort of a newer diagnosis, um, but it's it's kind of talking about some of these um, uh, normal age-related declines that happen, but it's be sort of between what's typical decline and what we would refer to as dementia. And do remember that dementia isn't one thing. There, there's 
a number of different types of dementia. The right. most prevalent, of course, is Alzheimer's, uh, but but there are are various other um, forms of dementia. Uh, but mild cognitive impairment is in between, and and hence the word mild. It's not right. so severe That's that the opera, right. Um, right. Mm -hmm. right dementia, but mm -hmm. it is more so than what you would consider with typical aging. Mm -hmm. And so, as you said, um, you, you know, whereas you have those those normal um, things that happen with the reduced brain mass and, and some of that cortical thinning and reduced white matter and things like that. With mild cognitive impairment, some of those symptoms, some of those characteristics are just a little bit more than what we would typically expect. Right, right. A little bit beyond the normal aging process. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But not, they don't meet the criteria for a dementing disorder. Not yet, right. The person is still, there's a mild impairment Okay, so you don't quite reach that level of the dementias. Right. But it's a hard diagnosis to, I mean, it's a, granted, it's it's a difficult diagnosis to make, a right. difficult differential diagnosis to make. Right. And it, and it's, in many ways, it's a very, um, it's one of the more clinical diagnoses to make when it comes to cognitive limitations, because, um, you, you know, you're talking about what it was like before. And what mm -hmm. it's like now, um, you're, you're, I, like you said, you're not going to see some of the significance that you would see with uh, dementia, but you're going to see, okay, well, you know, it, they're, they're decreasing um, much, much more quickly than we would expect mm -hmm. by normal uh, aging. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's probably a good way to put it is you're, there, it's a little more than what you would see in normal aging. You, right. You're, you're going to get some, here you have a mild impairment. Okay. There, right. There, it's a little more concern. I um, had a patient not long ago, and he started to forget tasks at work. Right. You know, he was still able to function. He could get to work and do his job, but there were just things that he couldn't remember anymore. Right. He probably qualifies for a mild cognitive impairment. Right. He can, yeah. He can do most things, but he's starting to. There's starting to be some impairment. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so again, the, the, you you see some of the shrinkage and some of the decreased volume in different brain regions. And whenever you see decreased brain volume, volume of the actual brain material matter, right. um, there, there's these areas of the brain that um, have fluid in them called ventricles. And right. um, when you have decreased brain uh, volume, you have increase in these, in those ventricles, you have increase in the, the amount of um, brain fluid in, um, that your brain is bathed in. Um, right. Now, again, nobody's, you're not going to be able to go and get a brain scan and they say, oh, look, his, his, uh, you know, ventricles are a little bit larger than we would right. anticipate. And so, you know, he has mild cognitive impairment. It's not diagnostic from that perspective, but right. it is, um, it, it is consistent. It's sort of a, what we see overall in these, in individuals struggling with these kinds of problems, that's what we tend to see. Right. You have, you have fluid instead of tissue. Right. Okay. There's, there's, but how do you know what it looked like before? If I get a if I get a, a CT scan tomorrow, are my are my ventricles enlarging? Well, I don't know unless I had one a year ago. Right, right. And so these things are very. It's very hard to determine whether it's really pathological or not. Right. Yeah. So so we do know that people with mild cognitive impairment there is an increased risk uh, mm -hmm. of developing dementia. It and that's why I think earlier I said not yet they don't quite right. yet meet the criteria for dementia, but th there is some concern that they're going to be that they're on their way, and you'll see a lot of physicians start to prescribe medications that increase things like dopamine and different uh, neurotransmitters um, to to hopefully save off some of that um, decline. Right. Yeah. But about uh, somewhere between one and 3% of adults, um, aging adults, develop dementia every year. Right. And, and as right. you said, with the baby boomers approaching this stage of life, mm -hmm. that's going to, to be a lot of people um, mm -hmm. over the years. Right. And, and But there's only about 10 or 15% of people with mild cognitive impairment who go on so it it doesn't nest if you have if you have a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to progress progress to dementia. Right. And so, I think the two operative words here with mild cognitive impairment, one is mild. Right. Okay. You have mild impairments that you can probably manage, and it's not it's probably not going to be progressive. Yeah. Okay. So mild. And non-progressive, whereas the dimensions, dementias, 
um, are different. Right. This, this is a different category. Right. And, and there are some typical things that we see in people with dementia. And, and I, I think that the easiest way to talk about this is to is to talk about change. And, and you know, as you're watching or as you're, you know, caring for a, an aging loved one, right. um, you, 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 you see the decline and you, you see you, you know who they are. You, you've seen them over the years. And what happens as you approach these years is you see that decline in skill or in that increase in symptoms, it, it happens much more quickly. Right. Um, you know, there are things that happen very gradual, of course, but, um, you know, for those who have had a family member with, with Alzheimer's, for example, you know that, you know, things seem to be okay, but then there were, suddenly there were these times when they were way off and completely lost. And I, when we talk about ADHD, we talk about people who kind of get distracted. And so they may be on their way to the living room and then on their way, they get distracted by something and they forgot what they went in there for. And, and you know, if somebody has sort of always had some of those kind of characteristics or traits. So if your loved one has never had those before, never really struggled with that too much before. And then all of a sudden, now they're starting to have that. Now they're starting to do that. That, that's a concern. That's a concern more related to dementia than something like ADHD or um, right. something else that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right. And one of the one of the nice ways of conceptualizing this difference between ADHD, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia is with ADHD, you have a decreased rate of learning, whereas with dementia, you have a rapid rate of forgetting. Right. right, and I, and I, I understand that because what people will tell you as they age, they will say, "Well, I can do everything; it just takes me longer. I can do the same stuff; it just takes me longer." Right. That's that's what that's what ADHD looks like. That's what normal aging looks like. It just takes me longer because the brain isn't quite as fast as it was when you were in your twenties. With dementia, you have this rapid rate of forgetting. OK, mm -hmm. and in fact, rapid forgetting is the first and worst symptom of Alzheimer's. That's what that's what everybody worries about is this very rapid rate of forgetting. You don't see that with ADHD. Right. You don't have this rapid forgetting with ADHD. Right. You, you misplaced. You can't remember where your keys are. You forgot where you parked your car at the airport. That's normal. That's 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 not impairing. That's normal. Right. Um, but the rapid rate of forgetting is is the distinguishing characteristic of the dementias right so so when we're diagnosing and we're trying to differentiate between these the first thing that you have to do is we have to get a good history um because again one of the ways or one of our best ways of being able to differentiate is to to look for a change in symptom presentation or a change right. in behavior if a person has always had some of these symptoms um, and, and you, you talk to, you know, their, their spouse or something and their spouse says, oh, he was like that in his twenties. Mm -hmm. It's like, he, you know, he could never find anything. Right. Okay. Well, you know, that's a symptom or characteristic that's been there all of his life. Right. Um, if this is something new, then, then that's much more concerning. And so we have to get that history, um, especially the history back into childhood. If we're going to talk about it, making a, a diagnosis of ADHD, that's never been made. Right. Yeah, because people will say, you know, well, geez, mom, you know, she acts like she has ADHD. You know, you almost say it in a humorous way at first, right. you know, she seems so distracted. Um, but again, we have to remind ourselves that ADHD doesn't first appear at 75. Now, it symptoms could first appear in your 20s, not the disorder, symptoms, because it may be that the demands you're placing on yourself are such that suddenly your ADHD becomes a problem. It, it, it wasn't a problem in elementary school and middle school and high school. And maybe you even got through college, but then you get to law school or medical school or graduate school and the task, the demands of the task um, exceed your ability. To, now your ADHD right. blossoms. Now it becomes okay. evident. It's always been there, mm -hmm. but it became evident. Right. So the symptoms could appear in adulthood but the disorder was present 
as a, as a child, when you were a young child, okay? Right. The other thing that happens with the elderly is that symptoms of ADHD could worsen when you retire, mm -hmm. because again, you narrow down what you're doing and work structures your day. You know, people who retire will frequently say, what, what day is it today? Right. Because days don't mean as much. They're all the same, right. unless you have to go to work every day. Okay? Right. So work, going to a workplace, whether it's in your home or in an office, structures your life. Right. And when you take away that structure, people sort of become distracted, inattentive, and forgetful because right. you don't have that external structure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So so it's really difficult to make sure that the diagnosis is accurate. Um, and, and if you, you know, it, it takes a, a careful and thoughtful and experienced clinician to be able to differentiate ADHD right. from um, like Alzheimer's or some of the other dementias, um, right. uh, especially during their early phases. Yeah. Uh, but let's not forget other disorders that, that can affect some of these things too: depression, anxiety, uh, hypothyroidism. I mean, there, there are lots of other um, mental health and medical conditions that can cause some of these same problems. Um, and so we need to do, we need to be very careful when trying to differentiate and make a diagnosis of ADHD in someone that, you know, a, a, as they get older and have never had that diagnosis before. Yeah. Uh, comorbidity is a, is a huge complicating mm -hmm. factor. You know, about 45% of individuals with ADHD adults with ADHD also have depression and right. about 37% have anxiety disorders. And so you, you have to be very careful. Um, you have to make a very thorough, comprehensive diagnosis because there are lots of complicating factors in the elderly. The other thing about the elderly is that there are physical illnesses that begin to appear, diabetes and heart disease right. and, you know, um, all, all the neurological and um, heart problems that, that, uh, that accompany uh, the aging process. And so there are many other factors that impinge on the diagnosis, on the diagnosis right. um, in, a, in the elderly, in, in older adults and the elderly. Right, absolutely, absolutely. So, so as we try to pull all this together, right. um, you know, Nadal has a, um, she has a podcast and she presents information about, about some of these things. And when she talks about sort of the classic symptoms of ADHD in older adults, uh, again, these aren't um, novel uh, uh, symptoms. Uh, we, we see these across the age um, spectrum, but they are especially difficult in individuals as they get older, but those unpredictable gaps in memory um, you know, like I said, the example I gave a minute ago, you know, you go into a room and you forget what you went in there for. Mm -hmm. Um, I can, a lot of us experience that a lot of times people experience those things as they get older, but, um, you can see it with ADHD again, it's a, a more, um, consistent pattern that you see throughout the ages. That's right. You don't, you don't forget. People often say, well, I forget why I walked in here, but you don't forget every time. Right. Okay. You're not always forgetful you it's an unpredictable forgetting you know right. so I just forgot my I can't remember where I put my keys but normally I do remember where I put my right. keys okay so and um misplacing things forgetting words right my goodness forgetting words begins in your 40s I mean easily begins in your 40s so that's not a huge thing sometimes your brain your brain just goes blank and you say yeah. what, what what was I doing here you know what am I doing here um, but what you need is um, you need more assistance. You need more planners, more reminders. You have to leave notes for yourself. Um, but a big thing with ADHD is it's harder to learn new things. Right. But that's not, it's it's always harder for people with ADHD to learn new things. Right. Yeah, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't suddenly start when you're 70. Oh. With oh. the, you have ADHD, that has always been the case. When it, That's okay. right. You, you, you've always had a hard time learning new things. It's always been harder for you than it was for others. Okay. Right. And so it's just that now the whole, the whole graph is down a few right. notches. Okay. So what the challenges that, that um, the reported by older adults who have um, ADHD is they don't get it. They don't get things done. They don't, they, the task completion seems to be a problem. They procrastinate, you know, um, poor self-discipline, trouble getting started, lack of motivation, 
staying on task. But again, these are all the problems that we see with youngsters. Right. I mean, go to any college classroom. If you have ADHD in college, these are exactly the things that people complain about. Goodness, go into any third grade classroom. Yeah, right. It's the or same go, problems. Go to a third grade classroom. Right. But that's that, but that's the point with ADHD. It's there all along the way. It just right. manifests maybe a slightly different because it's different in a, a third grade classroom is different than a college classroom, which is different than, you know, your, your employee, um, your place of employment. So right. um, the, the location is different. So it, the topography of it, the, the, mm. the appearance of it is slightly different, but it's the same underlying problem. Right. right. Um, yeah. So we, all, we can also think about how to, you know, minimize, yeah. or decrease the issues associated with cognitive decline. Right. Um, and, and that is, you know, um, <laughs> you have to be careful of, um, you know, you mentioned things like uh, diabetes and things like that. So anytime we offer uh, ideas or thoughts about how, how you're eating, you know, always be mindful of, of those kinds of things. But, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's some great research on keeping your gly, uh, glycine uh, levels, your um, glucose levels low. And so, you know, e eating for a, a reduced number of hours a, a day, you know, keeping your, keeping your diet uh, restricted to about eight hours of, of eating a day um, and then fasting for um, a longer portion of the day, the other 16 hours or so of your waking day. You know, that's probably one of the most, that one of the easiest and most important things you could do is, and I didn't realize that, I, I mean, we all know about intermittent fasting, you know, as a weight control, but it also reduces inflammation. Mm -hmm. and, and it's one of the things you want to do, the elderly should do to keep that glycemic index low, is to just eat during this eight hour period. If, if you start eating at eight o'clock in the morning, eat until four or five o'clock in the afternoon and give your body a, give your body a rest so that it can um, pull itself back together. And it, and it takes longer when you're older. Yeah. Um, certainly, you should fast before, at least for three hours before you go to bed. Right. Okay. Um, and, and we've known that for years because you, you tack, digestion interferes with sleep. Mm -hmm. okay? um, and so I think um, if you're, for, for both ADHD and uh, normal aging, I think it's probably a, a, an excellent first step is to reduce your eating to eight hours a day. Yeah, yeah, and and, and all of that, not to mention issues related, to re reduce your stress right. uh, levels in whatever ways you can, and and that's all types of stress, right. um, emotional stress, uh, cognitive stress, physical stress. You know, don't um, continue to hold on to that stress and and become stay over, so overwhelmed. Uh, but also exercising. We talk, yeah. to, talk a lot about exercising and, you know, the recommended, we're recommended to exercise 30 to 60 minutes, you know, four to six days a week. Yeah. How many people actually do that? No, we're talking, we, you know, we hear, well, exercise 30 minutes a day, three days a week. You know, that's yeah. a fraction of what you should be exercising. Right. Uh, the elderly should be exercising and they can't say they don't have the time. You know, most, most people over 65 or 70, you can carve out 30 to 60 minutes. And what's recommended is aerobic exercise that gets your heart rate up and gets your breathing. So you reoxygenate everything. Right. Uh, then getting, getting new oxygen into your system. You mentioned earlier about a more sedentary lifestyle when you retire. You know, the worst thing you can do is sit around all day. Right. Okay? You've got to get up and get moving and you gotta you gotta reoxygenate that blood. Uh, absolutely. Course, brain stimulation activities, you know, uh -huh. crossword puzzles, game shows. Uh, whatever you do to stimulate your brain, anything you do to stimulate your brain is going to be good for you. Right. And be mindful of the medical, of medical issues uh, as yeah. older, because, you know, you, you, you talked about this earlier, but anything, you know, cardiovascular, um, lung disease related problems, um, high blood pressure, all of these things can affect blood flow and oxygenation to the brain, which is going to affect the way in which the person's able to think and concentrate and focus. And so um, be mindful of how, medical illnesses can influence some of these symptoms as well right and then you have the medications you take right for those um and are those medications interfering right. with uh, cognitive functions so it is a it is a adhd is always a complex issue but it's more complex in the elderly yeah. because it mimics 
other issues that are normal, a normal part of the aging process, and you introduce more uh, medical illnesses, physical mm -hmm. illnesses, and the medications that we take as we age. And so it's a little more complex um, yeah. in the elderly. Right. Yeah. So, so I guess the, the bottom line is if you have you or a loved one um, is struggling with some of these issues and you have some concerns, make sure that you, you seek some professional guidance, um, talk to someone about it and, and begin that process of looking into it and, and kind of weeding through some of the possible causes or some of the possible um, related things that could be um, treated or affect uh, or managed better to to help with some of these issues. Right. And do, you know, help yourself, help yourself. You know, there are things that you can do right now today mm -hmm. um, that will reduce um, the effects of, of, of age related uh, cognitive declines. Um, and you can do those things, diet, sleep, stress, exercise. Those are things that you can do that you can begin today that will um, be useful. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, all right. Well, that is it for today. Until next time. Stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid.